It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Danica Ramsey Bremberg. Um, she was recently awarded a PhD in history from the University of Liverpool. Um, her doctoral thesis focused on Viking Age Vernish graves located in or near ecclesiastical sites in the Irish Sea area from the 9th century to the 11th centuries. And her current research continues her investigation into graves and ecclesiastical sites during the Viking Age, as well as popular portrayals of the Viking Age um, in film. Um, she's also co-host of New Books and Irish Studies, a podcast for the New Books Network, um, and she's uh, joined us this evening to give her paper on Irish Sea Connections in Southwest Scotland in the Viking Age. Um, thank you, Danica. Thank you to the Scottish Society for Northern Studies for inviting me, um, and thank you to everyone who's attending this virtual le um, lecture virtually. Before I begin, I'd like to apologize for any mispronunciations and also to let the audience know that while I will not be showing any detailed images of infant or child skeletal remains, I will be talking about them and showing a cemetery map in this talk. The Viking Age world was full of connections and lines of communications from Asia to North America and extended over a few centuries. Within this larger network, smaller systems existed, leading to more intense cultural, political, social, and economic influences and ties between geographic areas that extended over land and water. One of these was the Irish Sea area. The zone comprises Southwest Scotland, Northwest England, Wales, the Isle of Man, Ireland and Northern Ireland. The North Channel provides an approximate northernmost limit, while the St. George's Channel provides the southernmost. For the purposes of my research, I defined the eastern and western perimeters as being approximately 30 kilometers or 18.6 miles inland, so a day's journey, to provide a focus on areas closer to the coasts around the Irish Sea. While interactions between people, objects, and ideas have occurred within the Irish Sea area beginning in the Neolithic period, the Viking Age was a particularly vibrant time in which settlement populations and groups of people that remained more mobile either due to trade, politics, or various other reasons. Within this particular geographic area, the period has been typically described as being from 793 CE the attack on the monastery at Lindisfarne off the coast of Northeast England to 1066 CE, the Battle of Hastings, which saw the beginning of the Norman invasion in, in England. However, these dates are merely arbitrary with increasing evidence um, from archeology span suggesting earlier contacts and Scandinavian or Scandinavian descended rulership of areas such as Ireland, the Isle of Man, and parts of Scotland occurring until much later. A diaspora occurred in which not only people journeyed to different places, but ideas, beliefs, practices, artistic styles, and material objects were also transferred. Within the Irish Sea area, Southwest Scotland lies in the northwest corner and served as an entry point for traders, raiders, pilgrims, and other travelers to Western Scotland, mainland Scotland, as well as further west into Northumbria and the Irish Sea area. Its location geographically made it perfect for a landing and taking off place. During the Viking Age and the early medieval period in general, little textual evidence remains that can shed light on this period, aside from a few references to Whithorn Priory. Furthermore, the involvement of individuals from Scandinavia or with Scandinavian ties is only implied. We know that in 798, Innis Patrick, like the home Patrick, off the coast of Dublin, was raided according to the Annals of Ulster, the Annals of the Four Masters, and the later Annals of, Annals of Clon Macnoise. In order to get to this location, they would have had to enter the North Channel, passing Galloway before taking a right. It also quite possibly means that raiding occurred in this area, occurred akin to the rest of the Atlantic archipelago in Europe. There's also evidence of attacks further inland in Scotland, which would have required going through Dumfries and Galloway by water or by land. 
In 866, a mixture of Irish-based Vikings and Scottish-based Vikings invaded and raided the kingdom of Fortu, which was based around the modern-day Moray Firth area. In 870, Dublin-based Vikings seized Athlut or Dumbarton Rock in the kingdom of Strathclyde for four months and returned to Dublin in 871 with 200 ships and slaves and or hostages from different parts of the Great Britain including conceivably Dumfries and Galloway. Journeying to these areas could have easily meant going through or around southwestern Scotland. In 902, the, quote, heathens were driven out of Athcliath, or Dublin, abandoning ships and escaping, quote, half dead after they'd been wounded and broken, according to the annals of the Four Masters. Likely referring to the Scandinavian elite, they would have journeyed across the Irish Sea going to the Isle of Man in the Eastern Irish Sea area, including Dumfries and Galloway. Dublin was later reclaimed in 917, and many may have returned to Dublin with some possibly staying, but the influences from across the Irish Sea would have likely remained from this period. While not direct evidence, they do provide historical evidence of continual interaction over the late 9th to early 10th centuries. Sorry. It is slightly later that we achieve a direct reference to the area. The Chronicle of Man in the Isles refers to Magnus Berlegs, who ruled the Kingdom of Man in the Isles from 1098 to 1103. In 1098, the text states he, in reference to Magnus, compelled the men of Galloway to cut timber and bring it to the shore for the construction of the forts. Timber was a finite resource in the Isle of Man, which can be seen in the propensity of graves being constructed of stone as opposed to wood. Thought, though the exact circumstances regarding the compelling are vague, though violence or the threat of it may have been involved, the interaction provides further evidence of Irish Sea interactions. Although the place name of Galloway itself is thought to mean or derive from foreigner Gaelic speakers or Scandinavian Gaelic speakers. Its origin and date have long been a source of controversy with the word changing meaning over time and space with the term not applying to Galloway until the 12th century. However, the Scandinavian place names in Southwestern Scotland highlight the influence Viking Age settlement from various areas may have had, though caution should be taken with dating. One notable example is Tinwald in Dumfriesshire, which may have been the site of a thing or a Viking Age assembly akin to Tinwald on the Isle of Man and the Thingwalls in the Whirl, Lancashire, Orkney, Shetland, and elsewhere. Overall, the area is thought to have had settlement beginning around the 9th century, land holdings becoming significant in the 10th, and influences continuing through the Viking Age and afterwards. The degree of interaction can also be seen through hordes. Within Dumfries and Galloway, three hordes have been found that show evidence of Viking Age trade and travel via the Irish Sea. The Lochmore, the Lochmore Horde, which is now lost, the Telnotri Horde, and the Galloway Horde. They contained objects derived from different places, including Northumbria, Mercia, and the area of insular art, modern day Ireland, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, as well as Francia the former Roman Empire, West Asia, and Central Asia, where Viking Age raiding, trading, and movement occurred. Various singular finds from the Viking Age provide connections as well. The Dunradan Danen pendant, or Rarick Mounts, as it's sometimes called, which features a blend of 8th to 9th century designs from Ireland, Scotland, and Northumbria, and was a piece of metalwork later made into a pendant. However, the gold finger ring found in Tundergarth, Dumfriesshire, has parallels to design found in the Curadel Horde, as well as the now lost gold arm ring from the Hare Island Horde in County Westmeath, Ireland, that was dated to the late 9th to early 10th century. From the evidence of the raids, possible settlement and trade, and acquisition of timber, we can see a continuous series of interactions from individuals around the Irish Sea area. They therefore establish a precedence of Irish Sea connections in south southwest Scotland that can then be seen in other forms of evidence, even Viking Age graves with grave goods. 
Within Southwest Scotland, several furnished graves dating to the Viking Age have been noted both within ecclesiastical and non-ecclesiastical contexts. On the map, the green dots are those located at ecclesiastical sites, while those in pink are located at non-ecclesiastical sites. While we cannot be certain of their exact thought processes, alignment with a particular group, especially one with local power, could easily facilitate survival and movement up the socio-political hierarchy and or economic prosperity. Early medieval individuals and or groups sought to establish their power and status within the changing multicultural landscape in which new ideas and practices were being shared and blended together. Furnished graves at or near ecclesiastical sites were the product of negotiations between the clergy and the laity to gain and display power, wealth, and status. At the same time, those that were placed in non-ecclesiastical contexts likely held their own connotations, drawing upon ideas derived locally as well as from their Scandinavian ties that were derived from their homeland, that of their ancestors or individuals that they were familiar with. Before I continue further, I'd like to establish three definitions to make things clear. A Christian burial grave is typically an inhumation containing no grave goods, oriented east to west, placed supine in simple kissed, wooden, or earth cut graves in Christian cemeteries. However, exceptions to this rule exist throughout the early medieval world, including Scotland. A Scandinavian pagan burial grave is, though, typically an inhumation or cremation that utilized different practices and varied not just regionally, but locally, even in Scandinavia. Grave goods, such as small artifacts, i.e. tools, jewelry, weapons, vehicles, livestock, or in, and even slaves, could be included, and graves could be constructed from earth cuts to more elaborate structures using boats, ships, carts, or chambers. As a result, elements of a Scandinavian pagan burial could overlap with that of a Christian burial. However, many graves do not seem to necessarily fall into either of these categories. A Viking Age furnished grave is typically an inhumation, though cremation remains a possibility that contains grave goods from the Viking Age, and therefore different from the typical Christian graves, but not necessarily Scandinavian or pagan, and even partially. In the Irish Sea area and elsewhere, the line between what was considered acceptable may have been more blurred, and as such, all objects that may even indicate clothed inhumations, as opposed to shrouded, are included in this investigation. Compounded with the long, obfuscated process of Christianization, the line between Christian and pagan are blurred and hard to distinguish. Without time travel and a translator, knowing what the exact original intentions are are unattainable. Similarly, who these people were, where they were from, or where they traveled is not possible to know based upon the grave goods or practices. Therefore, while I will discuss influences from different areas, I will be talking about how the objects are Irish or Northumbrian, not necessarily the people. Numerous ideas and practices circulated this time and could have been acquired by all different people, much like today. While my previous research highlighted the crucial nature of using the term Viking Age Furnished Grave to Viking Age graves with grave goods at ecclesiastical sites, my current research into Viking Age graves with grave goods at non-ecclesiastical sites is finding that this term may be more applicable in some of these graves too. With different practices and ideas being shared across the Irish Sea area, not only were Scandinavian pagan practices being transmitted, but those related to Christian burial practices which themselves have been shown to be diverse by various scholars, may have been transmitted as well. Within Southwest Scotland, two Viking Age furnished graves are located at or near ecclesiastical sites. The first is located at Whithorn Priory and the other at the former St. Cuthbert's Church on the outskirts of Kukubri. Whithorn is a complex monastic site that is still under investigation today and has had a long history with prehistoric activity at the nearby St. Ninian's Cave. Whithorn Prior was a physically protected site, having been built in a hollow and near rocky outcrops on a peninsula, causing it to be invisible in some places. At the same time, it was easily accessible with the harbor being located about five kilometers or 3.1 miles at the Isle of Whithorn allowing the monastic site to play a crucial role in the Irish Sea Network. Different individuals, ideas, and influences can be seen at the site at different points in time, originating from various political, religious, and social bodies in the Irish Sea area and beyond, 
from the early Christian community in the fifth century to the monasteries founding in the sixth or seventh centuries, growth in the eighth, and its dissolution in 1587, Whitmore Priory continued to be an influential center politically, economically, and religiously, and was linked to other areas. This is beyond the fact that St. Nidian, or St. Nidia, is attributed to be the fourth to fifth century founder of a monastic community at Whithorn and may possibly have had Irish origins. Prior to the foundation archeological date, the settlement was already well-connected and continued to be so, by, as evidenced by Mediterranean pottery from the fifth to seventh centuries, sixth to seventh Gaulish pottery, sixth century North African pottery, wine and fine foods, as well as the fifth century Latinus stone, which features in a description to Latinus, a Latin personal name, son of Baradus, a Celtic personal name, and Latinus's daughter. It appears that the site was a key place of prestige in the Irish Sea in Britain, akin to cemetery settlements in sixth century Ireland. These connections continued later. Whithorn Priory was comparable to the other major Irish and Northumbrian monasteries, such as Glendalo, Clamacnoys, Armagh, Lindisfarne, Hexham, Hodham, Macquarie, and Jarrow, with parallels extending to the ecclesiastical, political, and monument landscape in the 8th to 10th centuries. Whithorn's situation of being a Northumbrian monastery situated in a wider trade network across the Irish Sea is also not noted by scholars such as Dr. Fiona Edmonds and Dr. Christopher Crow. Whithorn became prominent particularly in the early 8th century, the same time as other churches and monastic sites in Northumbria and could represent a reestablishment or new foundation during the golden age of monasteries. The multi-building complex was the foundation of learning through its monastic school and an institution of religion through its bishopric and it being a widely known cult stronghold with the relics of St. Ninian attracting pilgrims. The late ninth century, the miracles of Bishop Now is documented as being sent to Elquin at the court of Charlemagne, who wrote back and sent a veil, silk veil for Ninian's shrine in the early ninth century. In the ninth century, a large fire occurred burning down several buildings, including the burial chapel for unknown reasons. Yet Whithorn appears to have continued to play an economic role in the area, akin to the commercial activity of Iona, and was rebuilt beginning in the late ninth century with modifications until its dissolution. The collapse of Northumbrian rule allowed Strathclyde Britonic and Anglo-Scandinavian slash Hiberno-Scandinavian slash Scandinavian influence or control at the turn of the ninth century, paralleling other monastic sites. A preponderance of place names and architecture with Hiberno-Scandinavian, Anglo-Scandinavian, and Gaelic elements highlight how 10th century Galloway became a diversely settled area. Similar personal adornments have been found at Mules, Anglesey, Dublin, and York. With clear ties to Dublin, York, and Wales, including Lambergoch, and influences from my Hiberno-Scandinavian and Anglo-Scandinavian area, Whithorn Priory was noted for its trade in industry and manufacturing, including the Whithorn School for Sculpture. Its cemetery had a variety of burial constructions and several areas of materials denoting graves of high status individuals. This was an active time for the monastery and secular settlement, which appears to have been a population composed of Anglo-Scandinavians, Hiberno-Scandinavians, and local inhabitants of both Scottish and or Scandinavian descent. The placement of the Viking Age grave was just not just at a high status site, but also one that was a visible maritime power center that was integral to both lay and clerical settlement in southwestern Scotland and the Irish Sea area, which is reflected in the facets of the Viking Age furnished grave. Originally, when the exploration report was published in 1997, the remains of eight individuals were detailed as being uncovered between the east wall of the burial chapel and a line of rocks overlying fire debris, which represented a boundary from the previous period and concurrent buildings. They comprised three inhumations, one with grave goods and the other two with a cow for them, and four cremated adult individuals and were considered unusual due to the nature of finding cremated remains at ecclesiastical sites, and therefore, more akin to Scandinavian pagan graves, particularly as they were dated between 845 and 1050. 
Currently, the cremated human remains and the two individuals, the cow bone, are being reevaluated, along with other skeletal remains by the Whithorn Trust and the Cold Case Whithorn Project. Led by Adrian Maldonado and involving the work of scholars such as Assistant Professor Shirley Curtis Summers and Professor Derek Hamilton. As they appear to be more complicated than initially thought, only one grave that remains that is definitely a Viking Age furnished grave. An eight to 12 month infant, grave 55, was placed in an earthen grave along with an amular bead and a roughly finished shale bead placed on its chest. Tentatively an accidental inclusion, the placement on the chest could denote a necklace around the neck of the remains. Grave 55 may have been placed here due to the proximity to the pre-existing burial chapel at Whitmer Priory and or because of the other in children's and infants graves dating to the eighth or ninth century, which is around the same time the burial chapel was present. It's also about this time a resurgence overall occurred in the cemetery of Whitmer Priory. Grave 55 did date slightly later, but recent study proposes that nothing indicates a date later than the 10th century. Placing this grave not just distinctively in the Viking Age, but also at a point in time when the placement of deceased children was still in recent memory, even if a temporary cessation in burial had occurred for large numbers of people. More furnished graves might be possible at Whithorn and in the general vicinity of the monastic site or town, but until such a time excavation is carried out, Grave 55 remains this confirmed Viking Age furnished grave. The infant is akin to other aspects of Whitmer Priory as it parallels graves found elsewhere within the Irish Sea. Although physical endowment was not commonly used, it is not entirely unheard of as early medieval Christian burial in Scotland was not uniform. The Viking Age furnished grave in Kirkubri, which will be discussed next, contained a small black or blue glass bead among other grave goods. Other Iversey graves with either a singular bead or multiple beads are two graves at Carlisle and a grave each at Conkenhow, Tinwald, and Mackold on the Isle of Man, and St. Pat Michael Lapole in Dublin. More importantly is the parallel to the infant and children graves on St. Patrick's Isle on the Isle of Man. In addition to grave 48.16 L483, or the pagan lady, which contained beads at St. Patrick's Isle, Grave 84.16 L757 included six glass beads, one from the 9th to 10th centuries, two amber beads, and a small conical bell with a small ring. But more elaborate than that of Grave 55 at Whithorn, it highlights the inclusion of beads even in those of a younger age. Another child in Grave 85.60 L682 at St. Patrick's Isle only has two grave goods, two coins, while at Carlisle, Grave 138, Skeleton 2, is that of an infant who was buried with a coin. While they are only small in number, they reflect the practice of grave goods, which was something that could be extended to children and infants. The placement of the infant grave in this location meant that it was placed among other infants at Whithorn Priory, as well as next to the burial chapel, paralleling both furnished and non-furnished graves of the time period. Burials close to relics, ad burial ad santos, or heavily transversed areas meant that these placements within the ecclesiastical site held particularly immense importance and were prestigious. Several Viking Age Vernish graves were located just outside the church at St. Michael's Church in Workington, Cumbria, and the church at Cronkenhow on the Isle of Man. More importantly, Grave 55 fits a pattern consistent with other Viking Age Vernish graves at or near ecclesiastical sites further south in Northumbria. Unlike the Isle of Man in Ireland, these graves did not include weapons, but rather featured adornments and dress fittings or items of a personal nature. Not simply an interim phase before the monastic town, these reveal that the event, occurrence of events during the Viking Age that are far more complex than meets the eye and that the site maintained a high level of sanctity. Kubri, on the other hand, features a Viking Age furnished grave in or near an ecclesiastical site that holds more in common with its counterparts located in the Isle of Man and Western Ireland than at Whithorn in Northwest England. It was located to the boundary of St. Cuthbert's Church, just outside the town of Kukubri, overlooking the estuary of the River Dee on an eastern gravel ridge. The town had limited access, but was in a strategic position for defensive trade, controlling key water and land routes along the Solway Firth, 
and agricultural lands prior to the early medieval period and then afterwards. Influenced by sub-Roman Christianity, the monastery at Iona, Bernician rule, and Hiberno and Scandinavian and Anglo-Scandinavian local sediment and control of the town by the second half of the 10th century. Kirkubri was an early Christian center with Viking Age ties. The name of Kirkubri itself, which transferred to an inverted comma around 1200, even highlights either a late and later Norse, stemming from the Old Norse Kirkja or church, or English Kirk influence. A Viking Age glass linen smoother was found near where the later St. Cuthbert's church would be built in the center of town, which indicates a level of Viking Age activity or influence. During a political contentious time in the 12th century, Kukubri would become a power center with multiple ecclesiastical sites being built over its long history. Despite previous claims, the original foundation of St. Cuthbert's was located to the northeast of the Burr, where a later cemetery still stands along St. Cuthbert's Road. Slightly more inland from the town on a major land route, the ecclesiastical site and those associated with it was strategically placed. Mentioned in writing as Cuthbertus Kirsch by the 12th century, a long established community existed by that point. With an eighth century foundation, they came to have a Northumbrian cross from the Whithorn School, a school for educating and training students or novices in a mixture of Christian and pre-Christian practices. Aside from the cross, little archeological evidence remains with only sculptural stones, including a baptismal font indicating a former structure. The dating of the foundation is based upon the proliferation of the cult of St. Cuthbert and Bernician rule, both of which began in the seventh and eighth centuries and would have ensured strong ties to Northumbria due to the cult of network of associated churches, including Lindisfarne. Other churches dedicated or tied to St. Cuthbert have close associations with other areas of Scandinavian settlement and or have Viking Age Furnish graves as well, such as Carlo Cathedral in Cumbria. While the burial ground may have preceded the church in the Minster, both were of an early date, establishing an early ecclesiastical site intent on establishing a haven that could flourish into a town, taking care of the lady and maintaining the presence of the church at a high profile location. The furnished grave, which I've labeled grave one in my research, contained a small black or blue glass bead an Irish 9th century copper ally ringed pen, and the double-edged sword in a wooden scabbard, which in turn caused it to be gendered male and assumed to be pagan. Beyond the grave and the grave, grave goods in the grave's location, not much else is known due to a lack of recording or survival of evidence. No known skeletal remains were found or what materials, if any, were used to contain the deceased and the grave goods. Even evidence regarding the exact placement of the grave is meager, but previously noted as being within St. Cuthbert's churchyard near Kukubri. This might not have been the case as James Graham Campbell commented in his lecture, Whithorn in the Viking World, quote, the 1880s extension to the burying ground of St. Cuthbert's was up the steep slope beyond the old church so that this pagan Norse grave may well have been located outside, even if adjacent to and overlooking the Christian graveyard itself. This placement at the border of the cemetery means that this grave occupies a nebula zone as to whether it was inside or just outside the boundary. While the pin may have held close a shroud, the individual would have likely had to seek permission to be buried with the sword and the scabbard if burial was in the confines of the cemetery. Even if it signified well, the sword and the scabbard are unusual inclusions within a churchyard for early medieval south of Scotland. If the burial was placed just outside of the cemetery boundary, permission might not have been needed though, and the significance of being placed by the church would still remain, though not the same level of prestige as inside. Dating to the midi middle Viking age, the grave goods and placement do draw parallels to graves located in the Isle of Man in Ireland. Three Manx Viking age furnished graves were placed just inside the boundary of their respective ecclesiastical sites while two graves were placed just outside the boundary in Ireland. One Irish Viking Age Furnish grave was placed inside the boundary, four were just outside, and 22, 15 at Kilmainham specifically, 
remained unclear as to whether being outside or inside. All of the Northwest English Viking Age furnace graves, though, were distinctively inside, like Whithorn. Burial outside the boundaries has occurred at the cemeteries of Church Road, Lusk County, Dublin, and Duro County, Offley in Dublin. Oh, sorry. Church Road, Lusk County, Dublin, Duro County, Offley in Dublin itself, and expanding and contracting boundaries were present at Monk Wearmouth, Jarrow, Dacra, Bricksworth, in Islebury in England. So it may have been at one point in the cemetery, but the details of Kirkubri are too sparse. It would also just cement the parallels to the Isle of Ban in Ireland, where swords were in churchyard graves. In light of either case, they underscore a trend that perhaps developed in Viking Age Ireland or the Isle of Man, and then expanded across the waters to places such as Kirkubri. When looking at the grave goods, the inclusion of the Irish ringed pin highlights a popular trend that began in Ireland and was brought over during the 9th to 10th century to the Isle of Man, Scotland, England, and even Iceland. They may have been used for clothing and life, but in death they could have been used on clothing or shroud. In the case of Kukubri, it may have been, it may have had either use in light of, of light of its location. But the most important aspect was the inclusion of an object associated with Hiberno-Scandinavian dress. At the same time, Kukubri marks the only definitive ecclesiastical site with a Viking Age furnished grave on the eastern side of the Irish Sea area to feature a distinctive weapon. While other explanations exist for the spear in the Viking Age furnished grave outside St. Peter's Church in Hesham, the sword is a larger and more loaded object with its connotations and uses. In the case of Rampside, two swords were uncovered in the churchyard, but whether a church was present during the Viking Age is unclear. Yet, with a bull being sacrificed to St. Cuthbert on his feast day at St. Cuthbert's church outside Bukubri, according to Reginald of Durham's 12th century text, burnishing the grave may have been seen as acceptable prior to this in the 9th century. Kukubri, like Whithorn, underscores that different ideas were at play here and that practices and knowledge was circulating, not just at the local level, but among the Irish Sea area, as well as prior to them gaining control of Galloway. With both sites having ties to St. Cuthbert and reflective of the political and religious ties between Anglo-Scandinavian leaders and the church in Northumbria, they're also reflective of their 25 other counterparts within the Irish Sea area. They are on the map on the screen. The pink dots are definitive sites, while the turquoise dots represent possible sites due to a lack of concrete evidence regarding either the Viking Age furnish grave or the ecclesiastical site. While many of them had ties to the local area, they also had ties to various parts of the Irish Sea area, predominantly either through Irish or Hiberno-Scandinavian connections. This can mainly be seen through the origins of the earliest dedications, but also through sculpture, coinage, hordes, and connections noted in historical texts and hagiographies. The Viking Age furnished graves are similar as well. As noted before, it was not just physical objects being brought, stolen, traded, or gifted across cultures, but ideas and practices were brought over, shared, and learned as well, leading to changes among both the incoming and local populations. This can be seen with other aspects of burial practices, including location and the containers used to hold the deceased. While going into the full extent of interaction would require far longer than the time allows, the IRC area and its associated peoples are far more complex and multifaceted than has been portrayed, particularly in popular culture. The transmission of people, goods, and objects can be seen in graves located not at or near ecclesiastical sites. Within Southwest Scotland, two sites possibly have one grave each that date to the Viking Age and align more with qualities associated with Scandinavian pagan grave practices, the Christian burial practices. The first is at Ecclefechan, in which a type L pattern welded double edged sword was with recurved guards and a, tri, a three triangular lobed pommel with possible earlier non-ferrous inlay and a stamped pattern with a circular border on the central lobe 
was found in 1913. Little else is known about the find beyond the sword, aside from it being on the western bank of the Mean River, about nine miles from where the Solway Firth empties into the Irish Sea. Placing it here would have meant that it was a near a key route and may have been visible by those traveling, depending upon where it was placed. The sword can be dated based on the type to the 9th to 10th century, specifically 850 to 975. It may have Norwegian influences, though this has been debated. Thought, typically thought of as early English, swords of this type have been found more in Norway, as well as other parts of the Viking Age world, including Wheelham, County Kildare in Ireland, and Paris, France. This suggests the sword is represented of Viking Age connections, including those to Northumbria and further south. We can see parallels to graves further south along the Irish Sea coast, such as the 10th century type W sword found on the oyster banks, about 61 meters or 67 yards south of the vicarage in West Seaton, Lancashire. Furthermore, the placement of swords in dry context in Ireland is typically representative of burials, which could easily be the case here. The second grave is at Blackburn, which is 12 miles northeast of Kukubri. Uncovered in 1756, a cremation along with an amber bead and a late 9th to early 10th century Hiberno-Scandinavian silver arm ring fragment with parallel plain punched in markings on the flat side had been placed into a prehistoric cairn and on top of the prehistoric grave composed of a stone-lined grave, stone-lined coffin utilizing flat white stones. The grave was not, not only shows us, like at Whithorn and other sites, the Viking Age connections and transport of amber from places like the Baltic Sea, but also the economic connections between Ireland and Southwest Scotland through the hack silver. Other examples of Hiberno-Scandinavian hack silver can be found in hoards, such as the Curradale Hoard and the Silverdale Hoard, both from Lancashire, and of course, the Galloway Hoard. Examples were also found at Whithorn Priory. Furthermore, this grave lacks a weapon and only includes dress ornaments, making it more akin to that of Whithorn than Ecclefechan or nearby Kukubri. And the reuse of prehistoric sites is though different from all three. While Conk and Howe and Balladool on the Isle of Man were prehistoric sites before churches and the Viking Age furnished grave at Jerby Churchyard may represent a possible prehistoric cairn reuse. The Viking Age grave on the Isle of Skye is known to have involved another prehistoric cairn burial and creates a parallel. That lies beyond the geographic scope of today's lecture, so I won't go into it more. Echo Fecken and Blackern are two of the 34 sites where there are definite or possible graves with grave buds that date to the Viking Age. The yellow dots mean sites with definitive Viking Age graves, and the purple dots indicate possible sites of graves. While these graves show distinctive parallels to Scandinavia, they are like their ecclesiastical counterparts in that their grave goods show that the individual or their kin had in their, had in their possession and or access to goods that derived from or were inspired by places elsewhere in the Irish Sea area. My investigation into these sites is still ongoing, but the graves encapsulate the movement that is going on at this time, whether it be derived from raiding, trading, gifting, or manufacture. The burial evidence combined with sculpture and hordes suggests strong tides and activity around the Irish Sea area that, not, that were not just continued, but strengthened during the Viking Age. Although not necessarily directly connect, connected to a particular grave, sculpture provides a different form of monu monument through which ties to other cultures can be discerned, such as those around the Irish Sea area. The majority of the sculpture from the 9th to 11th century falls into the category of the Whithorn School and therefore shows a stylistic trend focused on southwestern Scotland. An exception to this is the 10th century cross at Rockcliffe, Cumberland, which has used boar and yelling style designs, but it has bossing on the circular cross head like those in Whithorn. Some sculpture does exist that shows connections primarily to Northwest England, but the Isle of Man as well. The use of small and sized crosses in the 10th century and 10th and 11th centuries occurred throughout Southwestern Scotland and Northwest England, as well as one piece in Middlesmore, Yorkshire. 
a hogback, which is distinctive Viking Age sculpture found mainly in Northern England, is that is shaped like a roof and served as a grave cover, can be found at Mossnow in Kirkpatrick Fleming, Dumfrieshire, and you can see it on the screen. The hogback has design motifs and structure akin to various sites in Cumbria and Lancashire and represents the only known hogback in this area, though examples can be found at Govan Old Parish Church in Glasgow. More prominently different is the Kilmory Stone, which stands in the churchyard of Kirkholm Church in Galloway. The shape of the cross is in the hammerhead form more commonly seen in Carlisle and Lancashire. The iconography on the front of the stone can be interpreted as deriving from Christianity and or Norse mythology. In the case of it being Christian, it could possibly be tied to cross, Christ or the cross itself or to a vision of the Irish saint, St. Columba, thereby highlighting an Irish sea connection. In the case of it being tied to Norse mythology, it could be Odin with his ravens, Hugin and Mugin, or Sigurd at the forge learning the language of the birds. This parallels two pieces of sculpture in the Isle of Man, one at Ramsey and the other at Kirk Andreas that feature similar Sigurd iconography. Other stones that feature Sigurd iconography in the Isle of Man can be found at the churches of Jerby, Malio, and Mackold. The stone could also be used to convey a combination of these scenes from Christian and North mythology. The back of the stone, meanwhile, features a spiral scroll, which is more commonly found in Cumbria, and a chalice with a vine that is akin to a shaft fragment at St. Peter's Church in Haitian Lancashire. Although not blending the same ideas and practices as the Viking Age British graves, the sculpture highlights the Irish Sea connections to the South and to the West, as well as the blending of different elements from different subcultures. The Viking Age was a complex time period within Southwest Scotland in which multiple groups of people interacted through different situations. These included raiding, trading, settling, and simply using the land as an access point to the Irish Sea area, Pickland, or Northumbria. As a result, people were impacted by not just the movement of people, but of objects, ideas, practices, artistic styles, and beliefs. Numerous forms of evidence exist highlighting these intricate relationships. Place names, hordes, single finds, texts, sculpture, and even Viking Age furnished graves. Particularly noticeable with furnished graves at or near ecclesiastical sites, they created a blend of practices that varied and shared similarities with different areas of the Irish Sea area and paralleled the places at which they were located. Influences can be expressed through grave inclusions, construction, location, and treatment of the physical body of the deceased. We cannot be certain of the underlying motivations. The deceased and their kid may have brought their own set of traditions, carried on those of previous generations who immigrated, or been influenced by others passing through or newly settled. We also cannot always be certain whether where they were from or had been, especially in instances where there's little or no skeletal remains left. Nevertheless, the graves at Whithorn, Kukubri, Echo Fecken, and Black Iron embody the diverse society that was forming and coalescing, and a wide range of burials were created, each showing a different set of traits to convey power and status. All four graves were buried at some point in the 9th to 10th centuries which was approximately during and after the period of attacks on Fortru and Dumbarton Rock and the ex exile and return to Dublin. It's also the time period of increased trade, industry, and manufacturing, and of designing metalwork and sculpture with styles and motifs inspired or transmitted by the Viking Age. A far more complex set of underlying political and social interactions were at play with the graves in which individuals were trying to encompass more than one influence intentionally or unintentionally. With a few of the commonalities may be coincidences, active decisions were required by the kin of the deceased when burying the dead. And these would have affected by the ongoing changes occurring in Southwest Scotland due to raiding, trading, or any of the other elements going on at the time. These graves were not separate entities in the Viking Age. They were multivalent undertakings, 
which were fully integrated into the religious, political, social, and natural landscapes, as well as the multicultural population. Thank you to everyone for your time, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Hi, thank you very much, Danica. That was an excellent uh, talk, very, very detailed. Um, and we do have a few minutes um, available uh, for questions. So if anybody would like to ask Danica a question, um, please put these in the chat and I will, I will relay them uh, to her. I suppose whilst people are thinking of questions um, to to write in, I suppose one one thing that that comes to my mind is obviously you've you've done quite a lot of work um, plotting out the geographic locations of of furnished burials, but also you've been looking at sculpture as well. Are you seeing any patterns with how this might correlate to other types of Viking Age finds, like boards or? individual finds is, is there a sort of geographical patterning that you're sort of seeing these clustering in the same areas or are the distributions not that complementary um in some ways it is very complementary i haven't investigated it um very far but mm -hmm. in the case of um not southwest scotland but more the isle of man you actually see very common of ecclesiastical sites being locations of hordes then you have this viking age graves going on then you have sculptures so you see these areas of interaction very closely but even with southwest scotland you see a lot of these influences clustering as in the place names they tended to be clustering if you see the graves you have um Black Heron being actually near Kukubri. So you do see these patterns of interaction as well as um, the, well, as well as other things going on. The one problem is though, is with things like single finds or with hordes that are recorded at a certain time period or even graves that were recorded at a certain time, they tend to not have, they didn't tend to think that all the details were necessary. So we're kind of left with knowing that an object was found vaguely in a particular area, but so that does make things difficult. Yes, for sure. And it, it's always an incomplete data set, isn't it? I mean, there's always new new finds coming out of the grounds as well, which can fill out um, this picture more. But, um, but yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Um, does anybody else in our audience have a, a question they would like to pop in the chat for Danica? Um, ah, uh, from um, one of the questions we've got here, Grave and Sky was mentioned. Are there any known from Kintyre and upwards in Western Scotland and the islands? Um, up into that area, you do have a fair number of graves, um, both within the inner and the outer Hebrides, as well as then you travel further north. Um, there, I didn't really talk about them because they are beyond, I did, I had to create a very specific geographic scope for mine uh, research, but you do find even more variation up there um, with the different, you have cemeteries going on up in the aisles. Um, I'd like to investigate it further, but that's that would be a project in comparing it, say the network among going on those burials down to further south. Excellent. We've got another question here as well. Um, the grave above Kakubri, could it also be seen as fitting into other Viking graves in prominent positions, possibly exhibiting power over the landscape? I think so. that's one of the interpretations that has been made with the particular grave of it almost looking, of, of it looking over onto the church. But at the same time, it doesn't necessarily, not necessarily show dominance in the way because you do have this very important site that's pre-existing, that it's already a site known for um, very prominent in the landscape. So it's almost in some ways could be seen as, a, you could say that it would be opposing it, but being located so geographically close to the border, it gets, a, that does get a bit tricky. So. Um, Knowing the motivations or the ideas behind these graves is really difficult to say. So you can say that it's associated with power and status, but going beyond that, we don't, unfortunately, we don't really know what they were thinking 100%. We could just sort of 
with archaeology or even with text, you can sort of make vague approximations. That's great, thank you. Um, any other questions that anybody's got? Oh, I can't, I can't see any that have come through on chat. Oh, hang on, just one, one coming in here next time. Um, okay, uh, so uh, this comment is fabulous talk. Could you speculate on what's going on in Wales? It's still relatively understudied compared to other areas around the Irish Sea for the Viking Age. Is it just an absence of archaeological evidence at this stage? I saw some dots on your maps, but not as much as for other regions. So there's a lot. I think it's part. I think it's twofold with Wales. I think it's one is there hasn't necessarily been the excavation involved. You do have a cluster of them tending to be up in the north over by particularly by Anglesey um, in northern Wales. And then you have a few that are outside my geographic orbit that tend to be on the south coast of Wales as well. But I think that it is an understudied area of the world and it's, um, particularly with the Viking Age, there is a incredible book that was released and I think it's out of print by Mark Redknapp that um, I gained access to because of the um, of the library at Liverpool. But I think that's definitely one of those aspects of I think there needs to be more investigation into Wales and hopefully with Viking Age being so popular now we can um, someone can sort of undertake that. That's great. So we've got a couple more questions as well. Um, so the next one is, are there any similarities that could tie the Whithorn Masonry School to the Hogback at West Kirby? Um, I think to some ex I think to some extent, I think that there could be parallels, but I think that the, if I remember correctly, the West Kirby Hogback has a bit more My brain is trying to go through the designs of it at the moment. Um, I think that there could be some ties between the Whithorn School. I'm not a sculpture expert though, uh, but I think Whithorn School specifically tends to be very insular in that you tend to see a lot of pieces, but as I think I mentioned that there's one piece in Yorkshire that serves parallels, but even that parallel is just saying that it has raised bosses. So I think that it shows that there was a lot of power with Whithorn in that particular area with regarding sculpture, but it also at the same time you have other schools of sculpture occurring throughout northern England as well as um, other places as well. So, but I think it's something that deserves further study. Excellent. And we, we've got one more question, which I think will be our last question as we're, we're coming up to eight o'clock now. Um, so uh, this is from an audience member, Jack. Speaking as somebody who explicitly uses modern geographical boundaries regarding modern reception of historical material, why Dumfries and Galloway in particular, and why this modern administrative classification? Um, it's something I feel I have to spend a lot of time and thought justifying. Um. I understand that completely. I use it mainly because it's a lot easier than flipping back and forth because this time period you have it being controlled by the Kingdom of Strathclyde, then you have it being controlled by the Kingdom of Northumbria and it keeps going back and forth, both um, the area of Dumfries and Galloway as well as Cumbria. And it's easier for me to use modern labels, especially when describing it to other people. Um, I also don't use the entirety of Dumfries and Galloway. I used a specific I did a specific geographic boundary of saying it could be a day's journey. And so I think it's more using the ter modern terminology is more for an ease of explanation rather than having to pause every moment and switch back and forth between, well, it's kind of Strathclyde, but it's kind of Northumbria. And then, but at the same time, we really don't know in this period. So it's kind of a making things easier type of a terminology definition. That's great, Danica. Thank you. Um, so thank you for such a wide range of questions as well there. Um, so it just remains for me to say thanks once again to, to Danica uh, for presenting her research on the Viking Age furnished burials um, in southwest Scotland. I'm, I'm sure we all look forward to uh, seeing some of the publications that will emerge from your current research. So thanks again very much, Danica. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming along as well.